by the way, if you're ever in Fresno, you must stop to see him. Marshall Fritz. Ah, <laughs> thank you. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is this microphone okay? Working okay? Or should I speak up? Uh huh. Yeah. Speak up. <laughs> to speak tomorrow too, so I decided please mic me tonight so I don't uh, uh, lose my, uh, my voice. We're going to be addressing, thank you by the way for that uh, splendid introduction. I'm so tired of writing those things for other people to say. It's neat to be working with a person who can go up and give one a cappella and keep you all interested. And uh, So this is the kind of bright young people that are coming into the libertarian movement as you look around. Uh, and there's also bright middle-aged people and uh, <coughs> bright grandfathers like me. <laughs> I just joined the Grandfather's Club uh, this last year, and yes, I do have pictures, and I'm sure you all will ask to see them, so you'll get that up. <laughs> I told my wife, I said, now, will you please pick uh, cute pictures so that uh, nobody has to strain themselves to say, aw. <laughs> and nobody so far, I haven't seen any problems there. It's really fun to be here. One historical footnote, and then we'll, uh, we'll move on. Jim, we seem to be getting a lot of, yeah, thanks. Um, thank you. This is approximately the 140th time this presentation has been given by me. And very likely it is the last time. Uh, I'm going on to some other things and starting the school. Uh, the, this is on videotape. We've shipped 700 or so copies of it. So if you really like it, you can replay it over and over and over. <laughs> I had to see it once. Uh, in fact, I was seven days in the editing booth trying to piece out parts uh, that uh, uh, that looked good and we could piece together and make you all think I just said it. So, uh, and interestingly also, one more data point, this was uh, this approximately 10 years ago, uh, plus or minus a month or two, but 10 years ago that I gave the first one of these when I invited, uh, libertarian doesn't make so much sense, I'll invite five people over to my home and explain it to them one night. And uh, that didn't work at all. So a month later, I, <laughs> I invited five more over to my house, different people. I wore out a lot of friends and acquaintances there. And, uh, and every month, I would have uh, anywhere from one to 10 people. One time it was one. And I would try to, and I would completely change the presentation or everything that didn't work last week or month, I would try it again. And uh, it was a couple of years before, uh, like uh, Michelangelo carving David, you know, I got rid of the marble that didn't look like him. And uh, there was finally a presentation. So what we're gonna do tonight is, is try to answer four, or address at least, four prime questions in about an hour, a little less if we can, and then uh, open it up for questions and, and have some question and answer. And we're going to finish at 7.30. One of the presidential candidates is right behind it, and I see no uh, profit in for me to, uh, to ever get in the way of a presidential candidate. So we'll finish right on time. The four prime questions, I believe, about libertarianism is, first of all, and this is an introduction to libertarianism, so one would expect us to start with what is it? What are the basic principles? Are these principles that are any good? Are the principles my mom and dad taught me? Are they something else? You know, what is this thing? A second question is, how does it compare to the things I already know? I sort of know this left wing, right wing uh, kind of stuff, liberal and conservative. Where do you guys fit on the political spectrum? A third question is, hey, <laughs> if these ideas spread around the, around the planet, uh, if this catches on, is this going to be good for me? Or, uh, or what? Is it going to be good for, for, uh, for my friends? Is it going to be good for people in my industry? You know, if I'm canning tomato sauce, uh, is it a good thing for, to, for the tomato industry? Uh, is it good for poor people? Is it good for uh, minorities? Is it good for tall people? Is it good for Chinese people? Right? I don't know. But, but these are the kinds of questions that people would ask as they encounter something that's as new and as big as libertarianism. Is it good for me? and my friends. And the fourth question is, hey, you libertarian, can you guys prove this thing is actually going to work and is possible? You know, where is the evidence? I want to see the evidence. So those are the four questions we're going to address this morning. The first one is, what is it? <sighs> we can answer that question any of a dozen or more ways in the sense of if we all had blindfolds on and we'd never seen an, uh, an elephant and we were to go grope an elephant, uh, it would take us a while uh, to grope the entire elephant, uh, assuming he was sedated, <laughs> and, uh, uh, or with discussion with our friends to, uh, to resolve just what an elephant is. It's, it's that big. You know, is it a fan? Is it a, a pillar? Is it a wall? Is it a water fountain? Uh, kind of a thing. 
And similarly, libertarianism is quite large, so I'll be defining it uh, more than once in the course of the evening. And uh, in each time, as I say, what is it? I'm trying to help you to, to have that sort of uh, uh, total view of the thing. Ah, you know, I've got it uh, kind of an attitude, aha. Uh -huh. So one way to define it is it's a combination of the liberty ideas of left and right. Uh, liberals, people on the left, tend to like freedom of expression, freedom of speech. And people on the right like freedom of enterprise. And if you combine free speech and free enterprise, you've got something quite old. It's the American ideal, but in a sense also quite new. Now, there's many people that, uh, that say, uh, don't label me. I'm uh, liberal on some issues and, and uh, conservative on others. And uh, maybe what they're saying is, is, you know, I haven't heard a label yet that, uh, that I like. I really don't think labeling is the problem. Handsome, intelligent, beautiful, um, 30 years old, uh, balding, right? They don't even have to be the uh, particularly uh, uh, charming labels, but as long as they're accurate, we don't mind being understood. It's the way we are understood. So I don't think labeling is the problem at all. I think it's mislabeling that we resent. Anyway, that's just a tangent. To get into libertarianism and into its principles, I'd like to uh, um, uh, kind of uh, play with uh, some people in the audience here, particularly if people are here for their first time. And, uh, and uh, John, uh, you look nervous as all get out. Can I pick on you? Sure. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, first question's the easiest, you know, so it's uh, not to fear, fear there. <laughs> John, if someone were to come into your house, he's uh, wearing a ski mask, he's carrying a shotgun, gets the drop on you, and he robs you of a bunch of your stuff. In your opinion, is, uh, is there something wrong with that? Yeah, yeah sure, he says, yeah, it didn't, that's an easy one. How many of us would agree with John? That's obvious, he's saying, yeah, okay, good, all but one. <laughs> good group, good group. Okay, over here, uh, you, uh, you introduced yourself, but you didn't get a name badge just yet. Edgel. Edgel, Edgel. Two people come into your home. Uh, again, they're wearing the ski mask to get the drop on you and all that sort of stuff. They're, they're cleaning out some of your stuff. You've got this great big built-in television set, and there's this argument that ensues, uh, do they have enough time to get the TV set out of there? Okay. And you bring up that your brother-in-law, a, a highway patrolman, is a due over any minute <laughs> to, to watch the game. Uh, it might be best that there, there isn't time. And they sort of decide to vote on it. And it turns out the vote is two to one and they take the TV set. Edgel, does the process of taking your stuff become morally okay if you're allowed to vote on it? If they employ democratic principles and allow you to vote? No. How many of us think that uh, if you get to vote on it, it's okay if people take your stuff? Only if you have a big family. Only if you have a big family. <laughs> oh, dear. Let's see here. Martha. Three of them come into uh, uh, your house. Uh, this time they're not even wearing, uh, they're very brazen now. They're not wearing uh, ski masks. Uh, they're dressed in suits and all that sort of thing. You can see that they're carrying guns. Uh, and they've prepared a, a list of things that they want you to, to give them, uh, including your Mercedes. Uh, uh, but one of them comments, he says, you know, Martha, um, young, uh, delightful people like you uh, should be in uh, an exercise program. And while we are going to take your Mercedes, we're going to give you this nice Schwinn. And we encourage you to uh, ride to work and ride to play and whatever. And uh, so they, they leave and all. I is it okay if someone takes your Mercedes as long as you get something, uh, some return on your investment? You got the Schwinn out of it. Is it okay now? Not a good return on investment. <laughs> not, not a good return, but is it, is the, does the morality of their taking your car change because they left you something behind. You got something good out of it. You got the Schwinn. Did the morality of the theft change because you got something? No. no. How many of us agree with Martha that the morality did not change? Okay, good. Uh, one sort of last question, picking out someone. Uh, Bill, there you are. Hi. Took off his name badge and everything, but uh, thinking he could trick me, but that's okay. I couldn't read it from this distance anyway. They didn't use the big pen. <laughs> He's not a true libertarian. He, he likes to put on a name badge. The rest of us have to be practically coerced into it. So uh, good for you, Bill. Uh, four of them come into your uh, shop. Same thing with the Mercedes and the list and all this kind of a stuff. But they do one more thing, uh, Bill. They, uh, 
they're going to not only give you a Schwinn, but they're going to give a Schwinn to a poor person down in Paraguay who needs a Schwinn in order for her to get to work and all and support her family. And uh, let's uh, say a couple of things here. One, you have not only a generic uh, belief in, in, in value in helping disadvantaged people, but you have a very specific uh, burden on your heart for the people of Paraguay. Uh, you lived down there as a kid, your mom was the ambassador, you went back in the, uh, uh, in the Peace Corps, and you've got this great sense for the people of Paraguay. Bill, does it, is it morally okay for someone to take your Mercedes if they do something that you consider good with some of the proceeds? Doesn't, not morally okay. Not, that does not become morally okay, in your opinion. How many of us agree with Bill that even though they're doing something sort of nice that we approve of, it doesn't become more, the morality of it doesn't change? All right. Uh, let's see, what are we up to? Four? Chris, what if we had 14 in the group? Would it be okay then? I don't think so. No? <laughs> uh, Richard, 40? Philip, 400? Uh, Linda, 4,000? 4 million, Phyllis? 104 million? Hey, watch it, guys. You're, you're wrecking the carpet. 104 million people? Yeah, John's saying, I don't know. It's a lot of people to crowd in the house. <laughs> the question is, how many people does it take in a gang of robbers to somehow transform the immorality of robbery, somehow transform that into the alleged morality of taxation? Fairly simple question, I'll repeat it. How many people does it take in a gang of robbers to transform the immorality of robbery into the alleged morality of taxation. Yeah, shaking his head. And that's the libertarian sort of answer. Is golly, there isn't sort of an answer. I mean, some guys get cute. Okay, uh, all of the world, you know, every, you know, the kind of a thing. Every, every, every person. But uh, uh, which means maybe it wasn't coerced if you wanted to do it yourself. You know, if you just gave somebody your Mercedes, that's not coercion. <laughs> Libertarians can't seem to find a difference between taxation and other subsets of theft. There's burglary, there's embezzlement, there's, um, oh, there's another one that starts with an E, uh, uh, extortion, um, robbery, uh, arson are all subsets, and even fraud and trespass, in a sense, are subsets of a general area called do not steal. And libertarian view of things, libertarians are folks that can't see a distinction, even if the theft or the, the confiscation is performed by a large number of people who claim to be doing good, and maybe doing some good things. I mean, I'm not saying the poor person in Paraguay couldn't use the bicycle. Now, lest you think we're tax protesters, uh, let me, uh, oh, there's occasional one now and again, so, uh, and then I go to Club Fed and come back out and say, well, <clears throat> it wasn't such a good idea after all. <laughs> they treated me okay, but it, you know, it was a year out of my life kind of a thing. Lest you think we're tax protesters, when my son, and I'm sure the same thing would happen to you if your son were to go to work in an all-night uh, gas station and he asked the question, what do you do, Dad, if a robber comes in? What do you suggest I do? And guess what Dad suggests? You give them the money. <laughs> you give them the money. You give them respect. Right? You give them you know, what they're asking for. When they've got the drop on you, they're dangerous. Now, is Dad saying that robbery is moral and good? Huh? Is dad any way? No. He's just saying, those folks are dangerous. Don't provoke them. Give them their money. And I think that's the basic libertarian stance towards taxation. Those folks are dangerous. Give them their money. So we're not anti-tax in the, in the, in the uh, 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 sort of different ways that there are to resist. You know, we're not in the tax resistance movement, the vast majority of libertarians. Um, but they, they, they carry this opinion that, it's, that it is an outdated, immoral concept. And in the same sense that we today look back on slavery as a poor employment technique, an immoral employment methodology. And uh, yes, we still have cotton. Isn't it nice? Right? 
libertarians predict that in, that in 50 or 500 or, or, or 5 or sometime, sometime in the future, that human beings will look back on the whole concept of taxation with the same attitude that today we look back on the concept of slavery. And they'll say, isn't it, isn't it, wasn't it barbaric? <laughs> they would threaten people with, with guns to take their money to help each other or to do things that they needed. Isn't it barbaric? And we'll still have roads and we'll still have police departments and we'll still have rules and laws and these kinds of things that we need. Um, it's just that the funding will be, uh, will be not coercively done. And uh, there are people here in this room, I'll bet, who have um, government provided garbage collection. And there's people in this room that have private garbage collection. And my garbage gets picked up on Wednesday by a private garbage company. And uh, if I want to, I can switch to Friday service. And there's a different, you know, uh, competitor. We want customers and their phone number right underneath it. It doesn't need to be a monopoly. And garbage, pri garbage collection privatization is a fairly easy one. Some are tougher. But that doesn't mean they can't be done. Not by a long shot. So when we get to the question, what is libertarianism? What is it? I think, hi, Dennis. <laughs> it's good to see you. Um, what is libertarianism? I think libertarianism is the basic principles that your mom and dad, in all likelihood, taught you. They're the principles that my mom and dad taught me. And, uh, and that, they are, that, that morality does not come from what the group decides. How many of us tell our uh, teenage uh, children, well, you just find out what everybody else is doing, and then you do that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> That's not the way we decide morality. We say, ah, oh, you Considines, we're different, right? We, you don't have to do that, right? Everybody's doing, uh, you know. There's some standard that's outside of just uh, all of us kind of guessing as to, uh, to some majoritarian approach. On a personal note, and then we'll move on. When I was about 11, my, uh, I uh, jumped off a roof. I, I thought I was fairly well prepared. I'd put a towel around my, a beach towel around my neck, and I hollered, Superman. <laughs> I was like, uh-oh. Some other people have used similar preparations. And uh, my father found out because of what happened to my ankle. And he said, uh, you know, why did you uh, jump off the roof? And I said, uh, well, because uh, Denny and Chucky did, <laughs> right? And uh, my father said, monkey see, monkey do. How many of us have ever heard that expression? Nothing my father ever said to me hurt as much as him uh, somewhat accurately calling me a monkey. I didn't like that a bit. And uh, from then on, I always jumped off first. <laughs> <laughs> And let Denny and uh, Chucky explain to their dads why they did it. Yeah. So, the basic principle of libertarianism is that you own yourself. It's an axiom. It's a, it's a fundamental sort of thing. The alternative becomes absurd. The axiom, you own yourself, has difficulty. But it doesn't become absurd. The opposite becomes absurd. I own you. You own me. We own him. I'll decide what you wear. You decide who he marries. He decides what I eat. You see, you see what's happening? We go crazy. If each of us thinks of the other as, you know, a that we can own them in the sense that you can own a parakeet or a, uh, or a lawn uh, uh, mower or something. And then, of course, they reciprocate. It becomes insane. If we really take it to its full extent, you know, we're, we're in fistfights or something within 20 minutes. Now, there are difficulties with the axiom. How many of us in here know someone who's not very good or perhaps terribly incompetent at running their own lives. May I see a show of hands? Okay. How many of us are sick and tired of those people trying to run ours? <laughs> see, the difficulty in the alternate axiom, you know, I own you and you own me, it's not that the, that, the, that the bright and nice and wonderful and decent people 
you know, like, like Bill and Chris and Chuck and, and me and, and both of you. I don't even know your names, but you just look so nice and decent, right? Yeah. We're not. <laughs> Somebody went to central casting and said, let's have a couple of decent people in the second row, okay? But see, the problem in that whole alternate axiom is that the decent people don't actually get to be in charge and run the world. You know, it's not the Mother Teresa that says, elect me, elect me. It's the Gary Hartz. <laughs> he can't run his own life, but he can run yours. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's the Stalins, the Nixons, the LBJs, the Brezhnevs, the Mao Zedongs, the Idi Amin's, the Papa Thaks, who rise to the top. It's not Tom Dooley, Schweitzer, Mother Teresa. They don't want to get into that stuff because it's corruptive, it's corrosive. Lord Acton said, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So. What is it? Libertarianism is in all likelihood the principles that your mom and dad taught you, it's the principles that the America was founded on. And if the founding fathers were able to come back today and shop around for a political ideology, there's no question as to which one they would select. No question. Question two. How does libertarianism compare to left and right? I mean, we're all used to this, uh, uh, this left-right spectrum, aren't we? Although, oddly enough, we never see it with tick marks. Makes you wonder what they're measuring if they don't have tick marks. But we'll put the liberals on the left and conservatives on the right. Everybody comfy so far? Okay. Uh, we've got to put people in various places. Some people put uh, Stalin on the left. They put Hitler on the right. Uh, Lisa, if Stalin is on the left and Hitler is on the right, who do you feel closer to? Woo, woo, tilt. All of a sudden, we've got around five billion people in the world trying to stand in the same spot in the middle. Well, what good is a spectrum measurer, right, that can't, um, you know, can't differentiate? There's something basically fishy with this left and right. David Bergler invented this way of debunking, I'm about to say, debunking this left-right spectrum. You were to meet somebody and he's prattling all the time about free speech. Would you think he was a leftist or a rightist? <laughs> Left? Okay. You meet another person, he talks up uh, all the time about free enterprise. You're going to guess he's on the right or the left? Right. right. Now you meet another person, he's against both those ideas. Where are you going to put him? In the middle, okay. And now you find somebody else, fourth person walks in and says, hey, I like both those ideas. Where are you going to put him? Huh? In the middle, right next to the person who doesn't like both ideas. There's something fishy in a two-point political compass, right? It ain't got no north and south. We're in the same um, mapping pickle that we as a human race were in four, five, six hundred years ago when we thought the earth was flat. And it's fine as long as you're making a map of downtown Madrid or all of Monterey County. But when your concept of the planet starts to include Africa, India, China, North Pole, South Pole, how do you get the thing on a flat? If your model is flatness, how do you get the thing on the map? You're in a pickle, and you need to have a, a shift in your, in your thinking. You need to, to go, and not just to a teacup, you need to go all the way to something that's kind of round, a globe, a sphere. And now you can, you can uh, better understand the planet Earth. And we're in the same sort of pickle with this blasted little simplistic two-point political spectrum of left and right a metaphor hung over for 200 years. Actually, this year, I would guess, or last year, was the 200th anniversary of the use of this metaphor. How many of us know where the metaphor even comes from? Show of hands. France. France, that's right. In the, after the French Revolution, you had the monarchists who wanted to restore the monarchy, and you had the 
uh, Republicans who say, you know, hooray for the Republic, and, uh, and they would uh, have sword fights uh, in Congress. And uh, that looks bad to the people. I mean, how are you going to like the, these politicians are killing each other in Congress all the time? And it looks stupid, right? Bad PR. So somebody thought, hey, I got an idea. Let's put all the monarchists, say, over here on the right, and we'll put the, uh, the uh, Republicans over here on the left, and we'll let a police march up and down the middle, gendarmes, and, uh, and then we won't be killing each other so much in Congress. And they, yeah, that's a good idea. That's the way they did it. And now this, mm. and now let's hear from the left. <laughs> this profound system that political scientists and journalists use all the time. There's <laughs> right? just nothing more than an outdated 200-year-old overly simplified metaphor. And what we need is really a four-point political spectrum. I'd like to propose, if we can get it right side up, a chart that actually has two measurements on it. It measures on its right scale economic self-government from zero to 100. I will admit to those precisionists that yes, even the numbers here are metaphors. But we have some societies where we have a very low degree of economic self-government. You know, if Tom Hayden got in charge, he knows, he knows so much about economics that he can run your life. <laughs> he just, he's just real good at that, right? Okay, and he's got lots of pals that will join him and run your life in the economic field. So he would like a low amount of economic self-government. Um, Milton Friedman, uh, uh, Jim Buchanan, uh, George Stigler, Friedrich Hayek are all four economists that have won the Nobel Prize. And they're all very bright chaps. But none of them thinks he knows enough to run your life economically. And if they were sort of in charge, and the power hadn't had too long to corrupt them yet, because they'd go just like anybody else. But in the beginning, they would very much prefer a high degree of economic self-government. They'd be out here somewhere in the uh, 80 or 90 or 100 percent. Likewise, and this clever uh, division, by the way, of human nature was devised by David Nolan, a political science uh, uh, major, a graduate of uh, MIT about 20 years ago. And on the left, what we have is um, human actions that are not measured in monetary terms. On the right, we're measuring economics. On the left, we're measuring personal matters. It would be ludicrous to say, uh, could you give me a $100 poem, please? All right? Uh, would you give me about $50 of Hail Marys? Right? I need about a $2,000 friendship. Right? Our relationship to God, to each other, our, our, the way we express ourselves, we don't quantify that way, do we? You know, we can quantify time in dollars sometimes. <clears throat> I'll pay you $2,000 to go downstairs and wash my car. Yeah? <laughs> oh, never mind. He, did it. he said he'd do it for 1000 <laughs> I could wash a car. You know, we can measure some things in dollars, but other things we don't. Just, they just don't make any sense. Now, using these two, what we have is a whole field of people over here called left liberals that tend to like a high degree of self-government in the expression area, this free speech, but sort of low in the economic area. Juxtaposed to them on the right are the conservatives who like, in America, a high degree of economic self-government, but a low degree of personal self-government. Jesse Helms would be glad to type up a list of things that he considers naughty and that you shouldn't do. Hmm? Uh, would like you to, uh, you know, he'd like to enforce community standards in this neighborhood. We don't look at pictures, books with pictures in them like that in this neighborhood. So conservatives like economic self-government 
but not personal self-government. The third person to walk in the room, the authoritarian, the Marxist, the fascist, the mercantilist, the just general purpose, uh, I can uh, tell you what to do, my gun's bigger than yours is, kind of dictator, agrees with the left. People shouldn't be allowed to run their lives economically. And he agrees with the right. People shouldn't be allowed to run their lives personally. The group, or me and my buddies is probably a more accurate term, should be making all of those decisions. There's the great mugwumps, the people in the center. But interestingly, the, con the, the flip side, the people who agree with the left in terms of free speech and agree with the right in terms of free enterprise are up here. And that's where a Milton Friedman, for instance, is, or a Buchanan, or a Stigler, or a Hayek, is they believe both in free enterprise and in free speech, freedom of personal affairs. When Buchanan was awarded the Nobel Prize, he was asked, uh, you know, how does it feel as a conservative to uh, receive the Nobel Prize? <laughs> he said, conservative? I'm not a conservative, I'm a libertarian. Yeah. Oh, well, then we'll write about something else, I guess. <laughs> There's a chap here, you may get to meet him. Uh, I always give him credit just on the off chance he's ever going to listen to one of these tapes and uh, make sure that I haven't swiped his stuff. Bill Evers, and uh, I know many of you know Bill. But this uh, part of this next concept I got from him and, uh, and part from uh, Joe Dean, who's now in Colorado, and you may know him. Um, and others may have had this, but those are the people I'm swiping this next segment from. And that is this. That map that diamond chart is just the stage. Here comes the play. What we love about America, those of us who love America, isn't the amber waves of grain. They've got lots in Canada and Australia and Argentina. And it's not the Purple Mountains. They've got some of those in Russia, some other places, Chile. What we love about America is our history of our heritage, our tradition of whatever brand name you want to call it, libertarianism, self-government. The brand name isn't particularly important. But those of us who love America, I believe that really is what we love. That's what we feel down there. And those of us that are feeling a, uh, a, a gut level kind of concern that something's not right, and I think it's more than sunspots, that something's wrong. Just a quick data point. Folks most of our age, not counting Martha and Phyllis here, a couple of the other youngins, but folks our age are the first generation of Americans in a test that I think Gallup has been doing for a number of years. The first generation of Americans who to believe that our children will not have as much opportunity as we have. And the youngins, Martha's age, and younger, coincidentally perhaps, I don't think so, are the first generations of, generation of Americans to ever say on this test, given every year, they believe they are not going to have as much opportunity as their parents had. Something's, something's changing. And I believe one way to see it would be to play with that metaphor of the pendulum. And we've all heard it, right? Not to worry, Mildred, the pendulum will swing back our way soon and our guys will get in charge and oh, Bill's nodding, <laughs> he's heard the pendulum argument a few times. Right. Well, let's look at this. The pendulum swings to the left and our friends on the left say, let's raise taxes and uh, get into income redistribution. 
and it swings to the right, then our friends on the right say, hey, let's have a war on immorality of some sort, drug abuse or what have you. Swings to the left, war on poverty, swings to the right, war on drugs, what have you. What's really happening is that that pendulum, when she swings back and forth, is going ever lower and lower and lower in an Edgar Allan Poe kind of scenario. Because as the left gets control, they do not put their energy into increasing free speech. A friend of mine says, it's getting increasingly difficult to be a conservative because all we've got to conserve is the socialism of former liberals, right? And when was the last time you heard a conservative getting up and railing that we got to sell the TVA? No, it's not. It's our TVA. <laughs> well, it's part of the American dream to have the government producing electricity. <laughs> right? Wouldn't be a good America unless we were sort of like the Soviets, would it? Heck, a few years ago, you know, you heard them switch on the deficit. Well, at least it's our deficit. <laughs> right? <laughs> Called it blank, blank. Yeah. It's just a horse race to see who gets to be in charge. There's two teams, the left and right. And my side will get it for a few years, and your side can have it for a few years. And that's just, it's just a tag team match. the Hulk Hogan's of political world. <sighs> How does it compare to left and right? When I'm asked, where do you libertarians fit on the left-right's uh, agenda or uh, um, spectrum? I say, we don't. We're above the line. And the Marxists aren't really on the left. They're below the line. The fascists aren't really on the right. They're below the line. Marx and Hitler Stalin and the whole ilk are just kissing cousins right down there. There's no real difference in what they were going to do to you once they get their hand on you. Who would be better off? Question three. Who would be better off? Would I be better off? Would people like me? Would my friends be better off? What would happen there? Well, let's look at the nature of man for a few seconds. And I believe that the nature of man and woman, nature of humankind, is that we want to govern ourselves. It's real important to us. Mom, let me do it myself. It's just, and we're so happy as parents and grandparents when we see children doing things themselves. You know, that first step, that first, you know, <laughs> no matter what they babble, it sounds a lot like grandpa. Right? <laughs> well, it does to me. <laughs> But the nature of, of man is that we want to have self-government both in the social and the financial aspect of our life. Now, a nice thing happens in a society if we allow uh, social self-government. Because from allowing people to govern themselves in the social or the left or the personal side comes tolerance. And from tolerance comes a harmony in society. When I tolerate you being a Protestant, when you tolerate me being a Catholic, when most of you tolerate me being a Christian, and I tolerate you being an atheist. <laughs> Excuse me, I got my audiences all goofed up there for a few seconds. Right? And we say, well, the Inquisition wasn't such a good idea. We'll have to try something else. And that didn't work out. When we get rid of that kind of nonsense, we can build a harmony in society. And we can live next door to each other and not have to have a replay of the Thirty Years' War. Similarly, if we allow people financial self-government, if we allow them to own their farms, for instance, what we see is that they become personally responsible for their productivity, and then we see an abundance. I think we'll be hearing from Mr. Chen tomorrow afternoon and his remarks on what's happening in China. But when people have personal responsibility, they tend to be productive. Just a quick story on an early um, communal living attempt. 
when a, peop when a group of people in Europe wanted to come to America, they needed a boat. This was quite some time ago. There were some social dreamers in England that said, we'll pay for the boat, but you have to agree to a compact where there is a common storehouse. And everything you produce goes into the common storehouse. And then each draws according to their needs. But we social dreamers have this plan, and these wealthy folks bought the boat. These folks schlepped all across the sea, came to America. And the first year, half of them died. The second year, half again died. The third year, the, the leader, Governor Bradford, said, uh, enough of this <laughs> um, social compact idea. Everybody's going to have his own corn crib, his own barn. And what you grow this year goes into your barn. And you get to eat it next winter. Because if we keep dying half halfsies like this, uh, you know, this isn't good. And that uh, fall, they celebrated a bountiful year. Because the prior two years, you see, well, I, I, I feel it on my heart that I should pray today, and I don't really want to go into the fields and work. Or my child needs me, I'm not going to go into the fields and work. So there just wasn't much work done. But when it was personal responsibility, then all of a sudden, there was a bounty, and they celebrated that fall. Does anybody know what that co was called? Thanksgiving is right. We've just been talking about the pilgrims and the Mayflower Compact. An early attempt at communal living that they figured out in two years. It's taken the Ruskies 73 years. We figure out this communal uh, stuff doesn't work out all that well. Uh, if it's a family or something as intensive uh, as the Franciscans, you can accomplish it. But that's in very small groups that voluntarily want to stay with each other. It's not uh, compulsory. What happens if you have both left and right? What you have is enough to eat and nobody shooting at you trying to take it away. And if you can feed your family and nobody shooting at you, that's sort of a basic uh, um, Maslow first level kind of slice of security from which you can start to build some other things in terms of maximizing human well-being. But you've got to have them both. You can't go halvesies on this thing. If you try to build a society in which you respect the economic, the, uh, economic self-government but not the social self-government and not that South Africa is very good over here on the economics, it's not. But it's a, tr a horrid mess with apartheid and everything on the, on the, on the uh, social side. And you have a society that's, that's, that's got some, uh, let's say, some major cracks in it. Put it mildly. If you do it the other way, build a Sweden, and you've got a relatively high degree of social freedoms, but economically you're a mess. And once again, you have a society that's crumbling. If you so much ignore the nature of government that you allow self-government on neither right or left, if you build a Soviet Union, you quickly have a rubble. And I used to give this presentation long before the Eastern Europe kind of a thing. And we used to draw comparisons, and still can, I guess, between an East Berlin and West Berlin. That's going into the, into the uh, memory hole now, and we won't have that same vivid uh, uh, play of the Berlin Wall in a few more years. Who would be better off? You would be better off. Your income will go up by 50% or more in a libertarian environment, and so will everyone else's on the planet, even as, as libertarianism spreads to their area. I'll show that in a few seconds. And that's before you start the 4% compounding annually of the increase in production, productivity 
that happens above even the uh, increase in uh, uh, people, population. And what you have is the capacity in a society like Ethiopia or Haiti or India, Pakistan, where I used to live, Bangladesh, you have the ability to quadruple the standard of living in 35 years. That's how productive people can be if you remove the shackles. They can grow the food, they can feed themselves if you remove the shackles. And the Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, the list goes on and on, are just more and more data points that are adding up that if you remove the shackles, people will produce abundantly. So that's what's in it for you. And by the way, not only will the poor people be able to quadruple their standard of living in 35 years, that's a lifetime, but middle class and wealthy people will go up by a near uh, almost the same amount. Perhaps they may go up by three, two to three times in 35 years. So that's the kind of potential. I'd like to show you just a little bit of arithmetic here. Those of you who rate, rate, uh, hate arithmetic can take a short snooze. Uh, this is not necessarily a typical family, it's just a family. But uh, we have a family whose income is $40,000. Okay? We probably all of us know somebody like that. And they get some benefits, uh, uh, they get um, medical insurance and that sort of thing. We should add that in. They really make $50,000 a year. Now, the government is taxing uh, the folks in America right now uh, anywhere 44, 45 percent. Uh, and that's not counting the hidden taxes where the government says, you businessmen keep track of all of this stuff for us, and the businessman has to hire somebody to keep all of these books for them just so they can pay the taxes. It's not even counting that kind of, of, uh, of, of drain on, uh, on people. But I'm just going to even use 40% here just because it makes the arithmetic easier. So the government's portion of the 50000 that you're earning is about 20000 and your take-home pay uh, in your pocket is actually 20000 because 10000 you got in benefits, or the other 10000 is. Now we're going to look at your take-home pay for a few seconds, and we're going to analyze, or we're going to analyze the government's portion first. The government is taking about $20,000 each year from this family. Now, if you were to identify the things that the government is doing and line that up with that particular family, and say, which of those things do you think ought to be done? It turns out that most Americans say, well, about half of those shouldn't be done. You know, I don't know why they took $85,000 of my money and sent a college professor to Peru for a summer to study uh, prostitutes in uh, Peruvian brothels. Um, you know, if they'd come door to door with the, uh, instead of the American, uh, uh, Hard or Red Cross or something like that fund, if they'd come door to door and said, uh, it's the uh, Study of Brothel in Peru fund, um, <laughs> I would have said, I'd rather have a pizza. Right? And if that guy wants to do it, let him go mow lawns for a couple of summers, save up the darn money, and then go take the third summer and go down there, right? You know, let, him, let him fund his own uh, <clears throat> studies. Okay? And that's just a silly example. But, you know, there's various wars and other things that some people aren't keen on that they might say, nah, I wouldn't spend my money on that. I'd spend my money on pizza, something useful to me. So you, you take a list. Any average American come up with about 50% he'd say, that's stupid. I wouldn't spend my money on that if, you know, I had my chance. Druthers on it. So you can stick into your pocket one $10,000 right away because if this is all privatized, you wouldn't be spending your money on that stupid stuff. You'd have the 10000 left. You're earning it, and if you wouldn't spend it, you'd have it. Well, now let's look at the other 10,000 that's being spent on things. Hey, I want a court system. I want roads. You know, I want, there's a lot of, I want national, I want parks. You know, I want that kind of preservation. There's lots of things I want. I want, certainly want schools, and I'd like to have education. Right? <laughs> oh, yeah. That'd be really nifty. So uh, there's lots of things that I want there. Um, about half of that money they're spending, they're spending on things that I would actually like. 
Now it turns out that if when things like that are done privately, they cost about half as much as when the government does them. And the ratio changes that the government's had it for a long time, like the post office, probably could be done for about a third that much. But uh, most things you can figure at least a half you can cut out just if you let private people do it for a profit motive. Which means that if we privatize the stuff that you do want done, Phil, you'd save another $5,000 each year if you were a $40,000 a year guy. Quadruple that in some cases. Okay. So you get back in pocket one, $5,000. Poc pocket two, $5,000. You can add that up. Turns out to $15,000 a year for this family. That comes to a $1,200 a month increase. That works out to around $300 a week. Now, what would you do, Martha, with an extra $300 a week? Well, I'd bury it. <laughs> I, I sure wouldn't want to spend it. Right? How many of us, if we had another $300 a week, would put it into either vacation studies, health care investments, vacation homes, hobbies, generosities, home improvement, or something else? <laughs> Show a hand. But we wouldn't burn it. We wouldn't destroy it. All right. Got a typical American group that could handle another 300 bucks a week. The reason I make that funny point is one of the things they love to talk about is how they're helping the economy. We're helping the economy. Look, we're higher. Look at the number of jobs we're creating, right? As if, oh, yeah, that's good. Because if the people had all that money themselves, they certainly wouldn't spend it. <laughs> you know? Wouldn't create any jobs over there. Boy, I'm sure glad the government's creating jobs. Whew, how many are you creating there? Well, almost as many as were taken away. <laughs> Turns out. Yeah. I know my wife would get into the uh, home improvements part. <laughs> Who would be better off? You would be, the person sitting next to you would be, your children would be, your mom and dad would be. Poor folks would be, rich folks would be better off. If you got so darn much envy corroding your soul that you can't stand for rich folks to be better off. <laughs> Don't laugh, there are people that way. There are people for whom harming rich folks is more important than helping poor folks. <laughs> Wisconsin has a law in the books, it's spreading, other states are getting it, that no county or, or, or school district in Wisconsin can tax itself higher than, 20% higher than, any, uh, than the average, because that means you would be spending more on schools than the average, and we wouldn't want that. Right? If, if a little, not that I want tax-supported schools, but here you've got envy you know, on the books. If your little school district wants to tax itself and spend $10,000 on schools, and the average in Wisconsin is $6,000, you can't do it even if it's a 100% unanimous vote in your town. Oh, that would be naughty, because you'd be spending more on your kids and then, uh, than the other kids, and that wouldn't be fair. It's true in California right now. Uh, well, it's true from a different standpoint because of the way the funding is done in California. They did it. I never thought of that before. You're right. You're right. You're right. <laughs> They're rascals. They snookered me. We're all snookered, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for desnookering me on that issue. You're right. Everybody see it? <laughs> in California, the funding for, for schools used to be by the local taxes and the local school board. So if, if the folks in Phil's town wanted to have a higher uh, property tax, they could have that and have better schools. And the folks in your town were real cheapskates and uh, wanted to have poor schools and hurt the kids, and they could go ahead and do that. And uh, it just fills uh, homes that get worth more because uh, nice people would move to his town where they really were nice to kids and uh, had good schools, right? Uh, he's in Los Angeles. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so to make sure that it was even everywhere almost, in California, they change the taxing so all the money flows to Sacramento and then gets spread back out uh, more evenly. And they have a better, they, they did a better job of it than the folks even in Wisconsin have. And the uh, envy aspects of it had escaped me 
from, uh, from that particular thing. Yeah, but it's equally bad. It's equally bad. <laughs> oh, dear. We'd all be better off. Now, how can we prove it works? Two ways we can prove it works. We can prove it works with the evidence of the little picture and the evidence of the big picture. I'm going to get through this real quickly. The evidence of the little picture. We're going to play a game here for a few seconds, mental game. We're going to write the names of everything that you like, that you use, on three by five cards. So uh, eyeglasses, uh, blouse, um, belt, uh, necktie, um, uh, haircut, um, what do you call them, sweatpants, uh, chairs, um, Jack Daniels, uh, pardon? Pizza. <laughs> Pizza. OK. Uh, roads, schools, police protection, all this sort of thing. And we're writing all this stuff down on, on little three by five cards. It takes us all Saturday. And then we put them in as we write them down. We put them in two big stacks. One stack is stuff we get from the coercion sector. And I'm going to rename that the intimidation sector because coercion is not a dinner table word. You know. Oh, yeah, I got coerced today and wrote my. Uh, text them. But intimidation is. And then the persuasion sector, and the intimidation sector is made up of those people who sell you their goods and services through intimidation. You know, they kind of force you to uh, pay for it. And, uh, you know, taxes, basically. And the persuasion sector is folks who, uh, who appeal to, uh, to you um, 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 your self-interest and appeal to you persuasively. Uh, your Ford or your Toyota salesman, basically, uh, doesn't come at you with a gun and say, buy my Toyota. <laughs> the government may come at you with a gun and say, don't buy that Toyota because we want you to buy a Chrysler. <laughs> <laughs> with a bad transmission. <laughs> hey, look, that provides jobs for people to fix the transmissions. Huh? <laughs> what are you? So, I'm sorry, do you believe in joblessness? What's the matter with you? <laughs> Golly, I've got a troublemaker here in the front row, right, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, we separate the thing into these piles, okay? Called the intimidation sector and the persuasion sector. And then we play a game. Remember the kids' game called War? You just put a simple, simple card game, you pull them off and decide which one wins. Okay, and you said anything, it's a very simple game, but uh, good for their counting and uh, sense of gamesmanship, learning risk or risk aversion. <laughs> what we're going to compare is harmony versus strife. And we're going to compare abundance versus shortage. For instance, gasoline right now is coming primarily out of the persuasion sector. But there have been two times in memory of all of us when gasoline pricing was moved to the intimidation sector. Remember when we had the gas shortage and the government helped out <laughs> by controlling the prices? Now, what happened to people's attitudes when they were in gas stations? Did we have harmony or strife? Yeah, strife. We had shootings in gas stations. Folks, you remember that? Or am I talking? All right. <laughs> OK. We moved gasoline from persuasion to conservation. Boom, and we moved from harmony to strife. By the way, did, what happened between abundance and shortage? All of a sudden, we moved from abundance to shortage. 90 days later, when we allowed the free market to control the prices, what happened? We went back from shortage to abundance. OK, because at, at 79 a gallon, there wasn't enough. At 99 a gallon, there's plenty. You know, and now the, because prices are working. Prices are very compact information nodules. Prices do work for us. They're crucial transmissions of people's wants and needs and availabilities and the supplies and where it ought to be. It's why the socialism fails, is it doesn't have those little information nodules called prices. No, I'm not going to pay that for a, a pair of pantyhose. Oh, really? Three pair for a dollar? OK, I'm going to pay that. But see, that, that little pricing nodule is information to you. Now, we're going to play a game. I go over here. Blindfolded. You could actually come up and blindfold me if you want to. And I pull off two at random. We've already shuffled them. And then I look at the two cards. Ha! <laughs> Same ones as last week. What do you know? <laughs> Human blood plasma and the post office. And we'll just talk for a couple of seconds about them. 
Human blood plasma in, or blood, whole blood in America is pretty much in the persuasion sector. There is nobody in jail for failure to pay his blood tax. You know, there is no give a pint or go to jail. It's all given voluntarily. Either by nice people. How many of us are nice people and have uh, given blood? May I see a show of hands for all the nice people? Okay, and I know there's other nice people. You just had diseases that don't allow you to, right? And uh, some people uh, sell their blood, right? Yeah, college or whatever, poor, what have you. And, uh, but they went in of their own persuasion. And how much blood do we have in America? Oh, about this much. How much do we need? Oh, about this much. Right? And then what happens? Well, there's a big problem somewhere. Uh, there's a, uh, a flood or a, a fire. There's a, you know, there's, a, there's a catastrophe somehow, and the need for blood shoots up. What happens that week? What happens that week? The supply of blood shoots up. People respond. Completely voluntary. And then after a couple, three weeks, the need for the blood starts coming down. What happens then? The supply comes down. You never read about a blood glut. <laughs> because it's free market. Now let's talk about the post office. Well, I shouldn't have given, I shouldn't have telegraphed what I was talking about. You probably would have guessed. Uh, there's a girl, I think she was about 11 or 12 years old, uh, middle school anyway, in uh, uh, Cortland, New York. And uh, they were given an assignment uh, to uh, interview some businessmen. And uh, uh, there's a way to get them out in the community and do some interviews, okay? So this, this girl decides that she, and she lets it go to the last minute. This thing is due, you know, before Christmas vacation. She lets it go to the last minute. Finally, she goes out and interviews two people, a Kmart manager and a, uh, uh, a postmaster. And the first one, I'm not going to tell you which one she interviewed first. You're going to have to guess, okay? So listen carefully. She goes out and interviews this one, and, and she says, uh, I guess her survey question was, she had one survey question, how's business? That was her survey question. So she said to the Kmart manager, how's business? He said, oh, business is fantastic this year. Uh, we're staying open extra hours. We have extra lanes. We've hired extra people. Uh, this thing is just fantastic, you know. Uh, business is great, okay? Now, uh, which person was she talking to? Okay. Wait a minute, did I telegraph it? <laughs> Why do elephants get flat feet when they jump out of trees? Right? <laughs> it was funnier uh, 12 years ago. You're right, it's Kmart that she was interviewing. <laughs> We're rewinding the tape so we can uh, not telegraph the punchline this next time. Okay, thank you. You would have laughed if I'd said it right. It's true, all right? Thank you. Other audiences have, right? Then she interviews this other guy and uh, says, how's business? He says, oh, we told everybody back in September <laughs> to mail early. It's not our fault. <laughs> the lines are so long. You laugh. I visited the uh, University of Oregon or something. What is the one in Corvallis? Which one is that? Oregon State. Oregon State. I visited Oregon State, and I know it was in September because I remember that vacation. We drove up to Oregon, went by there to get a sweatshirt for my daughter, and she's in a different college, but they like to wear each other's sweatshirts. And we, and was, we were walking out of the student store, and uh, this was sep September the 20th, a couple of years ago. There was the sign, mail early. <laughs> you know, Christmas is right around the corner. And that's not her fault. I mean, how were they to know Christmas would come this year? <laughs> now, my point is this. If you play the game, with or without the cards, but if you play the game, if you write down on three by five cards the names of things that you like, that you need, that you want, you put them in the two stacks and you compare them and you say to yourself, which one do you get with harmony and which one with strife? America's got this fantastic pizza system and there's lots of harmony. What about our education system? Is anybody saying it's fantastic? No. Strife. Shortage. And when you've done the first 10, you say, hmm, 10 to 0. I think I'll do a few more. 20 to 0. Hmm. Pattern is beginning to develop. 
50 to 0. I wonder if it holds. Who's winning on the harmony abundance question? And I contend that everything that you're getting in your life today, that you're getting with harmony and abundance, is being provided by the persuasion sector, which, by the way, is open to the public. That's why I don't call it the private sector. And the things that you're getting today, with strife and with shortage, well, we can't expand north of town, we can't get necessary government services. You're getting from the coercion sector, which I refuse to call the public sector because people are sometimes arrested for trespassing on public property. <laughs> this is the evidence of the little picture, the evidence of the big picture, a little bit different. If we were to take just a vertical scale, if we compress that whole diamond chart down to just a single vertical scale and we were to measure the percentage of self-government, admittedly the numbers are metaphors. On something like this, and this used to work so well before the Berlin Wall, because we could plot some countries and we could say, all right, here's East Germany at 33%, and here's West Germany at 55%, and then we could ask the question, which way does human migration flow? Upward. How many people are rushing out of Hong Kong today trying to get into mainland China? <laughs> let me in, let me in. Boat people, boat people, oh, we're ready to go to Vietnam. All right, come on, come on. Ah, uh, February the 15th, 1991. 7.30 at night, the next speech is about to start. How many people are on a rubber raft right now paddling toward Cuba? <laughs> I mean, it's time for metal floss, right? <laughs> Where is the proof that self-government works? It's in the experience of human migration. And people migrate toward more freedom. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. We will take questions. There will be no time for answers. <laughs> I, I'll take them real quick. Bill? Um, I expected to hear something on the, uh, when, when I joined the, uh, officially in the Libertarian Party, I had to sign a pledge yep. uh, that I was opposed to the use of force to with the, the uh, uh, instigation of force right. to political and social uh, right. problems. And I have heard nothing tonight about, the, uh, about that. I kind of expected something. Um, as I say, there's 101 ways or 1,001 ways to define libertarianism. And I, too, have signed the pledge. How many of us have signed the pledge? May I see a show of hands? OK. And, uh, um, and there's, it's just a different way of, uh, of describing it, but uh, and, and a perfectly wonderful way. Uh, someday, I hope there's a book of one-liners on describing libertarianism. Um, so I didn't mean to, uh, to leave something out uh, in that. You had a quick question, Martha? No. You had a, it was a long one. All right, yes, sir. Uh, it's uh, an, 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 an anti-freedom attitude. The PC, the whole thing is a uh, form of authoritarianism, and it's more and more towards the authoritarian corner, people that are somewhat left liberal but are really more authoritarian. They're only considered, I think, most of those people that insist on that, uh, they're only considered left liberal and that they're thinking in terms of this uh, two-dimensional scale. And if you were really to go out and test them very far, I think most of them would fall down in the, uh, they'd be high left authoritarian or low left, low left, uh, far left. So, uh, and, uh, you know, just, they're just closer to Marxists and fascists than we are. New thing. A lot, yeah, new, <laughs> new thing for you. Well, yes, one last uh, zinger from the last row. I'm always careful there. Uh, well, what a shame we didn't have time for her question. Go ahead. <laughs> Good and loud. Yeah, the free rider question, there's two questions. The free rider question is, are they using my, um, my, buck. my dollar, okay? And there's two ways to ask that question, and I do not wish to offend you, and I'm sure if we got to know each other better, we would, I would 
I would, I would find that what I'm about to say applies to other people who ask the question the way you did, and not to you. <laughs> There's two ways to ask the question. One way to ask the question is, would there be enough roads? Would there be enough blood? Would there be enough whatever if it was voluntary? I think that's a wholesome question, and I'm glad to address that, because it shows a concern for human needs. There's a different question, though. What if I were to give blood and others weren't, and then they were the free ride on my blood? What if I were to be so nice as to pay for the roads, and then the other people use my roads to go buy pizzas? Right? <laughs> and that, ladies and gentlemen, is covetousness. A word that almost isn't used. I mean, if the old-fashioned sins are gone. Sloth, <laughs> lust, <laughs> covetousness, can't pronounce it anymore. Right? The new sins are poverty, um, injustice, uh, greed, these kinds of things. So I'm afraid that if you study your motives there, uh, you may find that the motive is covetousness, covetousness. You want that $10, and you don't want them using your road. And I don't, do not mean to offend. Thank you very much. Take it away, Patrick. <laughs>